Tonight, media from New York to London to Washington, D.C. follow up on our refugee scoop yesterday. But why the cone of silence from Canadian media? It's February 9th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon yeah. consumer I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. Yesterday, we broke the news that the Liberal government has ordered the Department of National Defense to draft plans to house 6,000 Syrian migrants on Canadian military bases, turning them into long-term refugee camps. We obtained the documents through an access to information request about government funding for mosques and Korans. As I showed you yesterday, the Department of Defense has budgeted hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy Korans, Muslim prayer rugs, and even to build mosques. This is a shocking news story, especially as Justin Trudeau announces that Canada is abandoning our allies and sending home our CF-18 jets from their mission against the Islamic State. There are so many reasons why this story is news. I mean, why would you take poorly vetted people from a terrorist hotbed of Syria and put them smack dab in the middle of Canadian military bases? I mean, isn't that a security risk? Doesn't that disrupt the purpose of our military bases? Why are we asking Canadian soldiers to get out of their barracks so foreign citizens can get in? Why does Trudeau think our soldiers shouldn't fight in Syria, but rather should turn their Canadian bases into permanent bed and breakfasts for Syrians? How bizarre is that? I mean, no other country, not even migrant crazy France or Germany does that. What about the separation of mosque and state? Is it not bizarre that in Canada, you can't even say the Lord's Prayer in a legislature or a school, but we are purchasing hundreds, maybe thousands of Korans and prayer rugs and actually building mosques with taxpayers' money, money diverted from our soldiers. And why? Why are we rushing people from refugee camps in Turkey or Jordan into military bases in Canada that are becoming camps? These people are not being rescued from a war zone. They've already fled the danger we're just resettling them from Turkey to Canada, from one ca camp there to another camp here. And into the Quebec countryside, 25 kilometers north of Quebec City, could there be a weirder place for 3,000 Muslim migrants who don't speak French? The plans call for them to be there for six months at a time. What are they gonna do there? There are no schools there. Well, there are, but they're built to teach Canadian curriculums to Canadian kids en français. And what if these migrants want to leave? Surely they won't be cooped up on a base for six months like a prison. They will surely have legal rights to come and go. How many days before the young Syrian men want to go take a look at some pretty French girls, maybe go out to a bar for the first time in their lives? having come from a Sharia-compliant community where liquor is banned and women without hijabs are banned? How long until we have the gropings and sexual assaults like Europe has? Why would you dump 3,000 Muslim migrants in the Quebec countryside in a small town? Did you even ask the people in the neighborhood? There is a Muslim migrant camp in the French city of Calais. It's nicknamed the Jungle. It's on the coast. It's about the same size as what is planned for CFB Valcartier. It has been the site of rapes and riots and arsons. Is there something magical about our 3,000 migrant camp that will avoid those problems in Calais? Do you think that John McCallum, the stunned fool of an immigration minister in Canada, is smart enough or careful enough or thoughtful enough not to replicate those French problems in Quebec? There are so many problems here, so many questions. But why is no one asking those questions? We posted the full access to information documents about these plans online on our website. There's no question that this is a real plan. I mean, three months ago, the CBC, of all people, confirmed that Canadian soldiers at Valcartier were being ordered to prepare to vacate their own homes on the base. Yesterday, after we aired the story, I received several emails from Canadian Armed Forces personnel confirming what I had reported and telling me details about the mosque that is being prepared on their base. So 
Why the total silence from the media party about this story? I mean, you can agree with this plan to turn our soldiers into social workers. You can agree with the plan to turn our military bases into refugee camps. You can believe that 3,000 Muslim migrants cooped up in the Quebec countryside, bored, nothing to do, no language skills, no job skills, no cultural skills. You can believe that will go better here than in the Calais jungle. So you could totally support this idea, as 90% of Canadian journalists surely do. But you've got to admit, it's still, it's big news. Or you can oppose it and admit it's big news. Or you can take no position on it and still acknowledge it is big news. But not a peep. We are the only Western democracy turning our military bases into refugee camps. That is startling news. And yet, crickets from the mainstream media? But of course, I mean, they would rather poke their eyes out than to cover a story that we broke. But more to the point, they know the Canadian public would be shocked and outraged by this, and yet they support it, so they want to let sleeping dogs lie. Until the 3,000 Muslims show up in Valcartier and the other 3,000 in the other Canadian forces bases in Ontario. And when it's done, it's a fait accompli, and then what? Look, they're not journalists. They're un-journalists. They don't want to report the news. They're anti-journalists. They don't even want us to report the news. They're about filtering, about stopping. The word media means they're the medium, the flow-through. They're the middleman passing on news and ideas to the people. No, they're not. They are the gatekeepers now, working in tandem with the government. I see coverage in the United States and the United Kingdom about this. The Daily Caller reported on our story. The Blaze, Breitbart, London. Well, what about that 99 Conservative MPs in Canada who were re-elected, who championed the military, who tried to revive the military both financially and more importantly giving it respect? Where is the Conservative Party? Have they nothing to say about this? Not even a question to ask. Are they so worried about being criticized for criticizing? Are they so gun-shy about political correctness? Are they so shell-shocked from losing the election last year that they are afraid to even oppose the government, even though their official title is opposition. They are paid to oppose, but they have been so cowed and cucked that they won't even ask a question. Look, these migrants are not real refugees. They've already resettled in Turkey or elsewhere. Canada is not ready for them, obviously. That's why we're proposing to warehouse them on military bases. This whole thing is fake and rushed and artificial. It's a giant photo op for Justin Trudeau, but more so a massive voter resettlement program, 50,000 a year for four years. That's 200,000 new liberal voters, all Muslim, all from Syria, all jumping the queue over other immigrants and other genuine refugees. Even a pro-refugee, pro-immigration advocate could criticize this, but total silence. This is not me asking for the world to pay attention to the Rebels news scoop. That already happened. More than 100,000 Canadians came to our website yesterday. More than 40,000 more read our email about the story. It has been picked up around the world, from London to New York to Washington, but in Canada, silence. I'm sorry, this is collusion. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I'm saying it's a culture. We have a culture in Canada that is so politically correct, so politically homogenous, so think-alike, so despising of contrarians or dissidents that it censors stories of the gravest importance. We have so many reporters that we have entire news stories written about Justin Trudeau's socks. That's Aaron Wary of the CBC writing about that. I'm not sure if that's more embarrassing or this one, also from the CBC, of a girl reporter so giddy about seeing a Hollywood actor, Kevin Spacey, at a convention with Justin Trudeau, she takes a picture of him at the coat rack and writes a news story about it and later asks for a selfie with him. So that's news at our state broadcaster. But not that we're turning seven bases into refugee camps? Because that would be to deviate from the official line, wouldn't it? This causes me great despair. To me, it is a sign of a congenital weakness in our democracy and our media. I suppose, in one point of view, I should rejoice and say, well, we here at The Rebel will have the entire market for ourselves. Here at The Rebel will be the only media outfit talking about these things, and that's why we're getting record traffic. 18 million minutes of video watched in the past 28 days. Six million minutes of video watched in the past week. These are records for us, which tells me Canadians are desperate for the other side of the story. Watching the media and the political class studiously avoid this issue 
It feels like I'm walking by a property with a very tall fence, a property I've never seen inside, and then one day a single plank in the fence is missing, and, and I can glance in as I walk by just for a moment, just for a flicker, and see for a second what life is like behind the fence, just for a moment, just for a flicker. I feel like I have just seen how it works, the media and the government in total cooperation, the total censorship of the Canadian media political class about news so shocking that even foreign countries are taking notice. And it makes me think, what dozen or hundred other news stories have I missed because my moral and intellectual superiors in the rest of the media and political class didn't want me to know about it. Stay with us more on this issue after the break. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Welcome back to the program. Last month, we had a very in interesting conversation with Giddy Mammon, a longtime refugee lawyer who's a passionate advocate for refugees, but who brought some criticisms of the current liberal plan. Well, since we talked to Giddy last month, he was invited by the United States Senate to go down to testify before their Department of Homeland Security. You can see him on the screen there, giving a briefing to US senators about our Canadian system. Well, Giddy's back from Washington, and he joins us now via Skype. Welcome back to the show, Giddy. You're with the firm of Mammon, Sandalik, and Kingwell. Tell me about your trip to Washington. That's, I mean, a Senate committee, that is a very, auspicious and prestigious uh, meeting. What did the senators ask you and what did you tell them in return? Well, they called, they were looking for some information about our plan to bring in 50,000 Syrian refugees. Now, they weren't asking about the virtues of bringing refugees to Canada. What they were particularly interested in is the security implications for the United States. I mean, they don't really care what we do up here as long as it's not going to create a security issue for them. So they wanted somebody who knew something about the refugee process and to identify what might be security issues. Although I didn't call them saying, oh, this is a dangerous proposition. I just, I just responded to their questions and answered uh, the best of my ability uh, and talked about that. And that's what they were really interested in. They had a lot of senators from the northern states who recognized that we have quite an open border, uh, and they were very interested in participating in that conversation. Well, that's the thing. I mean, uh we have a de facto open border with the United States. I mean, sure, we have certain border crossings and you have to say hello to a border guard and maybe show a passport, but for hundreds and hundreds of kilometers, there's nothing even demarking the border. Uh, tell me what concerns these senators had. Can you uh, recall a specific question or line of questions that these senators put to you, Giddy? Well, the first thing they want to know is how on earth are we doing uh are we clearing so many people so quickly? They needed an explanation of that. You'll remember that Prime Minister Trudeau uh, came into office on November the 4th, and he had said that he was going to be bringing in 25,000 people by December 31st, which means 57 days. So you can understand a concerned neighbor like the United States that we have to the south saying, how on earth can you possibly do that? It takes us a year or two to do this. How can you do it in 57 days? So I explained very simply that uh, for the first batch, uh, we never got those 25,000 by December 31st. Uh, as I predicted, we only received 6,000. And of those 6,000, those, those people had been in the pipe for years. And so they had already passed all the, the tests. They'd been screened already. And we were just simply waiting for a document to be issued. So that's how the government uh, of Canada was able to, uh, 
to, to put through 6,000. And that was comforting to hear, um, uh, according to the senators, because they thought we were cutting, uh, we were, you know, we were making shortcuts, et cetera. Uh, and I explained to them now that the second batch, those who were not sort of cleared already by December 31st, the next batch we're actually going to have to do a lot more work on uh, if we're going to complete that 25,000 by uh, the end of this month, as uh, Prime Minister Trudeau promised. And then another 25,000 by the end of the year, of course. So that's a total of 50,000. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, Trudeau said 25,000 in the month of December. That was ridiculous. It was not possible. But saying 25,000 in January and February is only slightly less absurd, Giddy. I mean, uh, to, to put that through that kind of numbers uh, is still so many quantum, so many uh, uh, factors faster than we did before. Were the senators appeased by your explanations of this three month instead of one month? Schedule. I mean, I, I'm not, but how about those U.S. senators? Were they comforted by what you told them about the February deadline? Right. So, you, you know, my practice is involved with, you know, very complicated uh, immigration, and I go to court a lot, and I, and I clash with the CBSA and RCMP all the time uh, with respect to immigration matters. Uh, but uh, you got to be honest. Uh, these guys uh, are now required to move a mountain of paperwork and do a, a tremendous amount of security background checks in a short period of time. So notwithstanding the fact that I'm always uh, in conflict with these people in court, I have nonetheless every faith that these guys are going to do the very best job that they can to make sure that no uh, corners are cut, no matter what prime minister promises that uh, he can do within a certain deadline. I, I just believe the CBSA, RCMP, and CSIS have enough integrity uh, to make sure that they don't cut corners and put Canadians at risk. However, uh, let's, let's be serious. Um, when you ask somebody to do something that has never been done before, to process 50,000 people in under a year, and half of those in under a few months, you are creating tremendous risks because they could just simply be fatigued, they're under pressure to deliver a result, and something could be missed. And so I, I think the senators were happy that I had confidence in our security agencies, but they recognize that when people are pushed to the wall, uh, mistakes can happen. And that's something that uh, they simply needed to hear, and uh, they wanted to hear what, uh, uh, you know, maybe some other risks associated with uh, this, uh, yeah. this movement uh, might be. Well, I remember during the campaign, Justin Trudeau said the only problem was a lack of political will. If I was a civil servant who had to go through checklists and do tests, and I knew that watching over my shoulder was a prime minister who was impatient, who had his pride at stake, and who had said in the past that the only problem is political will, I would feel enormous political pressure to cut corners. But hopefully these professionals won't do that. Hey, I want to touch on two quick things, because uh, we've spent more time talking about your Washington visit than I thought we would, but it's very interesting to me, and thank you for that. Let me ask you two quick snappers. The first one is, I see that John McCallum has talked about, quote, radical changes to the Citizenship Act. I understand one of his changes would be to abolish a language requirement. I have not seen his full proposal. Do you know what uh, some of these radical changes are that he has in mind? Well, I don't know if it's going to be radical. I guess it depends on your point of view. Uh, we're all pretty satisfied that he's going to relax the language requirements. The, the Conservatives jacked that up quite a bit. And uh, I'm not sure I agree with that policy. I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there should be some measure uh, of a language requirement. But there's lots of people who immigrated to Canada, uh, made tremendous contributions uh, to Canada, uh, raised kids and put them through school and did wonderfully, and never mastered English or French. And I, I don't think that they're less Canadian uh, or less deserving of Canadian citizenship than uh, maybe someone else. Uh, but I have no doubt that uh, Minister McCallum is going to uh, relax that requirement that the Conservatives brought in. Um, with respect to uh, residency requirements, uh, you know, that was changed. Um, and so there may be some tinkering with that, but there is going to be a residency requirement. I can't imagine that being uh, eliminated, perhaps relaxed, but uh, I haven't heard too much 
uh, in the immigration world of a demand to change that. So uh, I, I don't think we're going to see too much of that. Yeah, I, I sense that we're moving towards uh, the German model of open borders. We'll have to see how far down the spectrum we go. Last question for you, Giddy. Yesterday, we published documents from the Department of National Defense uh, that were budgets and plans to house 6,000 Syrian refugees on Canadian military bases, mainly CFB Valcarche in Quebec, and, uh, and then about 3,000 sprinkled amongst five in English Canada. Do you have any comments on that? Do you, uh, what do you think of the wisdom of housing 3,000 Muslim migrants at CFB Valcarche for six months? I mean, I, to me, it sounds like these people would be isolated and ghettoized in neighborhoods where they don't speak. Like, it just sounds like we're putting them in a hothouse. Uh, it's you know, what, uh, what do you say? What do you think? I, uh, uh, I've faced a lot of criticism for everything that I've said about this uh, program. As I, you know, I've been fighting for refugees for close to 30 years. But, but you, you know, as a as a private citizen, uh, you, you have to you have to be honest a little bit. You know, when when, when Justin Trudeau said that he was going to do this, uh, he said he threw a hundred million dollar figure around, uh, and then it became two hundred million, and then within a few weeks it became one point two billion. Um, so uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around how your estimate was was uh, conceived and how what happened in the interim that you would now multiply it by a factor of 12. That's my first observation. Uh, secondly, we never had this discussion. Uh, I still don't know where, where and how they're going to spend that 1.2 billion. We know that a few hundred million is going to go to CBSA and CIC, etc. But we really don't know what is included in that. So now you're telling me as I heard yesterday, that we're going to be housing some people on a military base, which raises another question. Why on earth are we bringing people to Canada so quickly, uh, almost like a sport, when we are not ready for them? Presumably, you know, when you've got the paperwork done, you've got somewhere for them to stay, then you bring them in. But that's not what we're doing. We are, you know, uh, we have arbitrarily picked the date of February 28th, and by golly, these 25,000 people are going to be here by February the 28th whether or not they have to be on the street or in a military base. We've, we've also heard stories about hotels kicking out Canadian citizens so that, you know, uh, refugees could be housed in those hotels. The whole thing is crazy. Uh, the problem is that this was conceived uh, in an election campaign. It was a bid to outdo one another. Everyone was racing to the top. You know, the Conservatives said they wanted 10,000. Uh, they were prepared to do that. The NDP said, well, we'll do 10,000 plus nine every year as long as the conflict is going on. And somebody stands up and says, hey, I can top all of that. I can do 25000 by December 31st. Mm. Uh, and, and he got elected. So now here we are with this promise. But we're not ready. Um, we've just never done this before. And I don't mind. If we're going to bring refugees and, and Canada decides that we, we need to be more generous, I'm all for it. But it just doesn't seem to me to be out of a genuine concern for refugees. It just seems optimistic to me. And that's why we're not ready for anything. Isn't that uh, what a thoughtful and perceptive comment. Giddy Mammon, you're a man with a big heart. You truly love refugees. You've spent your life fighting for them. Your criticisms come from good faith and from experience, and I very much appreciate you sharing your views with us, as I'm sure the U.S. Senate did to your visit there. So thanks for joining us. That's Giddy Mammon, a friend of thanks. Canada and a friend of ours. Stay with us, folks. After the break, Lauren Gunter joins us with news on a shocking new poll from Alberta. That's next on The Rebel. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra Levant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the rebel.media slash store to find out more. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. 
If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Welcome back to the program. Well, I did a story a few weeks ago about a shocking publication by Statistics Canada that showed that while the private sector in Alberta has lost about 100,000 jobs in the last year, the public sector, the government sector, has never done better. 47,000 more government jobs in Alberta today than a year ago. My thesis is that there are two Albertans, the makers and the takers. The makers are doing worse than ever, but the takers, Rachel Notley's NDP base, well, they're loving it. Joining us now via Skype from Edmonton to talk about my theory of two Albertas is my friend Lauren Gunter, a columnist with the Edmonton Sun newspaper. Lauren, great to see you again. Good to see you. Thank you. I have, I, I've been puzzled by Rachel Notley's style, and her temperament and her tone. I keep watching her and I think, does she really think things are going great? In her year-end interviews, she sounded victorious and stubborn and tenacious, like she's winning, and all I see is wreckage. But both of these universes are coexisting. There's the public sector, Alberta, government workers, hospitals, teachers, you know, civil servants. That world is doing better than ever. The unionized public sector world is doing better than ever. It's just those foolish private sector guys that are having the worst time ever. So there's two Albertas. That's my theory. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, and you can see it in a number of ways. First of all, uh, housing prices in Edmonton are off a little bit in, uh, in, in 2015 from 2014. have dropped precipitously in, in Calgary, and they've fallen through the floor in Fort McMurray. So those two cities are the two big private sector cities. Uh, economically in Alberta, and, and they've really felt the hit. Uh, but Edmonton has it. Edmonton restaurant uh, patronage is steady. It's not up. It's not down. Uh, in Calgary, of course, there there's lots of evidence from the uh, the, the uh, hospitality industry that, that things are way off and people are losing their jobs. So uh, those are indications that people in Edmonton have money and people in Calgary don't. And the thing to keep in mind is that Seven out of 10 of Edmonton's largest employers are public sector. So that's the reason why we have, you know, we love government bill or, or if you called it Notleyburg. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly what's going on. Yeah. You know, there's a new poll out uh, by uh, Quito Maggi's group, uh, Main Street. Uh, let me look uh, at, at some of the stats that I think bear out what you're saying. In Edmonton, uh, the uh, Wild Rose Party is down at 18% whereas the NDP is at, at 44%, double uh, its uh, uh, two uh, opposition parties, whereas in the rural parts of the province, the NDP is down at 17%, the Wild Rose is up at 38 and the PCs are revived a bit at 35%. So Calgary and the rural parts, the NDP is out of fashion, low in the polls, third place would be crushed. But in Notley Grab, the capital, things are happy. If the election were held today, I think that the NDP would retain most of its seats in Edmonton, but lose every single rural seat because of their Farm Unionization Act, and would lose every single Calgary seat, even downtown. What do you make of my prediction? I think that's true. I mean, they might, there might be a, a vote split somewhere in Calgary that lets them keep one seat or two seats. But but they would not have the 14 seats that they have now. Uh, and and all they would be left with would be some seats, most of the seats in Edmonton, and some of the seats in the communities that touch Edmonton. But if you look at where, where they won in May of last year, of the, the 53, 54 seats that they won on election night, uh, only seven of them were not in Edmonton. Quite clear Cal that. that was or surrounding Edmonton. So they're very, they're a very urban party to begin with. And this simply shows that, uh, uh, that that has continued. The, 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 the number that jumps out at me, though, is that if you put Wild Rose's support together with the PC support, you come up to 64%. Yeah. In May's election last year, the two parties got 52%. 
In polling in the fall, they were up to 57% combined. Them up to 64%, which is where they are right now. That's kind of you know 70 to 75 out of 87 seats in the legislature. That's the sort of territory you're talking about. We could end Alberta's socialist nightmare yes. if these two parties would just get together. Yeah. Well, then certainly there are those who want to merge them. I think that there's some larger cultural differences between the PCs uh, and the Wild Rose that have nothing to do with right wing, left wing. I think it has to do with political yeah. entitlement and even culture of corruption. But uh, let's put that aside for one moment. I want to talk about what I think is a weakness of the NDP. And I know I'm bashing them here, and you and I generally ag agree that the NDP is bad for the province. But let me observe something about this particular NDP government that makes it different from the NDP governments that have uh, held office in British Columbia or especially Saskatchewan. Here's what I think is one of the key differences, Lauren. If you look at 10 out of the 12 original uh, cabinet positions, uh, they've just expanded the cabinet, but 10 out of the 12 first ones, the chiefs of staff running those offices were from out of the province. Brian Topp was brought in from Toronto to run the premier's office. Marcella Monroe, uh, she's, she's not a chief of staff, but she runs the premier's office in Calgary, she's a lobbyist from Vancouver. 10 out of 12 chiefs of staff from out of town. The new cabinet ministers also brought in out of town and NDP mercenaries. So you don't have a lot of real deep ties and networks in with the Alberta community, the business community, the, uh, you know. Yeah, no, and people. it's worse than that. I mean, it's, it, and it the goes MLAs beyond too. that. It, it gets into the fact that most of these people actually have disdain for Alberta. That, they, that they're not interested making, uh, in, in, in doing the best for Alberta. They're interested in remaking Alberta in their own NDP image. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, they despise Alberta for its environmental record. They hate big oil. They don't like profits. They dislike the fact that Alberta was the most uh, free market. And, you know, under the Tories, the Alberta, Alberta government was enormous. But they largely left business alone. Uh, they don't like that. And so that's that's one of the things that you see. The other thing that, that you see with with the NDP is they are, you know, you, you have the choice when you're a new democratic government on the, in a province in Canada between being a Bob Ray government or a uh, uh, Mike Harcourt government, a Dave uh, Broad, uh, 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 sorry, I'm, this is escaping me now, the guy from, from BC in the early 70s. Um, or you have, you could be the Saskatchewan NDP, you could be the old CCFers who knew how to balance a budget, who knew how to keep spending down. Uh, and this government is clearly of the former. It, it's the uh, the Dave Barrett kind of government. It's it's radical. It's free spending. It's going to remake the uh, the province in its own image. And they actually honestly believe mm -hmm. that the public sector can actually keep the economy going until the private sector comes back. Yeah. And that's just it's just foolish. Yeah. You know, one more thing I was going to add. I mean, I mentioned the let's say the the dozen or so uh, grand mandarins who are from Toronto or Vancouver. But that's not even the worst of it. If you look at many of the MLAs, the ordinary MLAs, they're either student activists who were just kids. Like they don't have ties in the community. They don't know. Uh, you know, they're not in Rotary Club. They don't go, uh, have kids in school, so they meet other moms at soccer games and they talk about real issues. So you have either uh, fringe candidates who were like students or scapegoat candidates just, you know, uh, take a run at things, or hardcore union activists. So even their, like the caucus, the MLAs who were supposed to connect the government to the people, they don't know real Alberta too. So you've got out of province mercenaries. No. You've got an MLA caucus that has no real ties to the community. So like you say, I think Rachel Notley and her, her courtiers, her palace guard, genuinely think things are awesome because for them it is, and they have no ties or roots to rural Alberta or the oil patch. Let me ask you this in closing, Lauren. How's it gonna end? How will this disastrous story end? 
Well, I think it'll end in 2019 when we're scheduled for our next provincial election, because I don't think Albertans will will put up with a second term in any way, shape, or form from the NDP. But you know, the other thing that happens when you have all of these people who are disconnected to the community is that you also have such tight control from the premier's office. You know, people talk about Harper's a dictator, Harper micromanages everything. Harper was typical of prime ministers, going back, every prime minister I've ever known or worked for back into the 70s worked, had the same tight control. And he had nothing on Notley and her uh, staff in her office because they have so many inexperienced people who are just ready to explode with, with bozo and bimbo eruptions on, their, on ideological grounds that everything is micromanaged from the premier. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? Lauren, great to talk to you. Let me close with a fact uh, that, I, uh, that I'm excited about and we haven't really talked on the show yet. You know, our own Sheila Gunn-Reed, our Alberta Bureau Chief, she wrote a book called The Destroyers, Rachel Notley's NDP in the War in Alberta. That book for three days now has been the number one best-selling book in Canada on Amazon.ca of nonfiction, fiction, American titles, Canadian titles, the number one best-selling book in the whole country is Sheila Reed's book. How can that be at the same time the premier is popping champagne corks? Well, the answer is the two Albertas. And the Alberta that is dissatisfied and hurting is large enough to make Sheila's book number one. Lauren, it's great to see you again. You fight for freedom every day in Edmonton, and we're grateful when you join us via Skype. Good to see you. Folks, stay with us. Okay. After the break, your viewer mail to me, and you take care, Lauren. So open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Welcome back, my favorite part of the show, viewer feedback. Ron writes, I'm seriously thinking about moving to Russia. Hmm. I know what you mean. Russia isn't beset by political correctness, by social justice warriors racked with white liberal guilt. When Russia fights against the Islamic State, it goes in and blows them up. It doesn't do pin prick attacks like Obama or blow kisses like Justin Trudeau. I understand what you mean. But despite all that, I wouldn't want to move to Russia. It's an authoritarian country whose civil liberties are eroding with a bully strongman as the de facto president for life. And if you think we have an Islamization problem here, well, just Google the word Chechnya. No, let's fight for a better Canada, not run away. Justin Trudeau only won with 39% of the vote with a full court press from the media forum after nine years of Stephen Harper fatigue. We haven't lost the whole country. The media political establishment just wants you to think that way. So you leave for Russia or something. Tony writes in, I've heard from credible liberal sources the reason Justin's pulling out the F-18s from the ISIS mission is so that he can whip them out and lead the charge of bombing climate change back to the Ice Age. Uh, don't laugh. As Mark Morano told us yesterday, the Pentagon literally has been ordered to put global warming into their military calculations and decisions. That's why the U.S. military never attacked Islamic State oil tanker trucks. Obama was worried about the environmental impact of a few pops of CO2. He was more concerned about imaginary global warming than real terrorism and murder and mass rape. And of course, he's Justin Trudeau's role model. Teresa writes, this message is for Ezra. I really appreciate your program and I'm thankful you do this. You are a great voice for free speech and especially telling the other side of the story. However, I really have a problem when you say, have a listen. Since when is listen a noun? Thank you again and keep up the great work. 
Hi, Teresa. I acknowledge that I sometimes use phrases that are not grammatically perfect. They are idioms or cliches or even mannerisms or tics. I probably wouldn't write that way if I were writing a book or a formal essay, but in conversation, I mean, don't we all use little funny sayings from time to time? I do. I mean, it's not like Dan Rather used to do, right? Remember this? This presidential race has been, you know, it's been cracking like a hickory fire for at least a, <laughs> the last hour and a half to two hours. Uh, I know that you'd rather walk through a furnace in a gasoline suit. This race is, is hotter than a Times Square Rolex, and it has been all night long. George Bush is sweeping through uh, the South like a big wheel through a Delta cotton field. He's got it back to the wall, his shirt tail's on fire, and the bill collector's at the door. The situation in Ohio would give an aspirin a headache. Oh, if you've been tuning in and out, or you put the baby to bed, or you went to pop the cap on an adult or otherwise beverage, John Kerry has a... His lead is as thin as turnip soup. Just to say if a frog had side pockets, he'd carry a handgun. Huh. Hey, that's it for the show today. What do you think? Do you think I'm making too much ado about our scoop yesterday that the government plans to turn seven Canadian forces bases into long-term refugee camps for Syrians. I think it's a huge story. I can't think of any other country in the Western world that's doing it. The story's being picked up by uh, media in New York, in uh, London, in Washington, D.C., but total silence here in Canada. And as I record this, not a peep from Her Majesty's loyal opposition either. I think it's funny, and I don't think it's healthy that we don't have a bigger debate in this country. I promise you, here at The Rebel, you'll always get the other side of the story. That's it for me today. Tune in tomorrow. Until then, keep fighting for freedom. Good night.